So, Lucia? All right, you're on. Great. And away we go. So, um, it is my pleasure to introduce Charna Berkovic, a former colleague of mine at the Leibniz Institute in Regensburg, and currently a lecturer in cultural anthropology and European ethnology at the University of Göttingen. Her work combines a focus on inequalities and power with an eye for social complexity and ambiguity. After her PhD at Manchester, she started developing two projects. One explores what happens with humanitarian affect and practices in Eastern European semi-periphery and how the fall of socialism transformed humanitarianism in former Yugoslavia. Another looks at the experiences and practices of sexuality and freedom among gay men in Montenegro. Charna is the author of Managing Ambiguity from 2017 and has written about care, favors, refugee camps, and histories of anthropology. So with that, I will hand it over to Charna and we can get started. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I would like to, to say thank you to Kevin for, for the invitation to be here and to talk with you. And I would like to say to all of you that I'm grateful that you, you are here. This is the second time that I'm presenting this piece of my research. The first time was back in 2018 uh, at an ASA panel for, for a conference in a much shorter format. And in the meantime, I've developed this into an article and also hopefully um, into, into some sort of future research direction. So I'm really grateful to you for this opportunity to present what is very much a work in progress to you today. And uh, I also look forward to your feedback and your questions and comments and um, and just seeing how this, this resonates with you. So I will start, I have a PowerPoint, which is not very um, visually appealing necessarily, but it does help, I think, to follow the argument. So I will um, yeah. I will keep it on for most of the time. So the talk is called Minority Sexualities, Kinship and Non-Autological Freedom in Montenegro. And I start with a description of two scenes. So scene one, it's a cold October evening in 2013 in Podgorica. Podgorica is the capital of Montenegro. And I'm going to Mirko's place. Mirko was then a man, a man in his mid thirties who has been one of my best friends for many years. And he is also the director of an LGBT organization in Montenegro. The building where he lived was in the center of the town. And in the dark front yard, I noticed two silhouettes standing nearby looking at me. Instead of getting scared, I realized that these were probably the police officers that were assigned to Mirko when he publicly came out as gay. So the conditions of Mirko's individual freedom in this context to be a gay man out in the Montenegrin public sphere, these conditions included regular police protection for a few months. The police officers were difficult to spot if you did not know that they were around. They kept Mirko safe and they also blurred the boundary between freedom and constraint. Scene two, um, a few years after, this is the first event that I described. I went to Ivan's house to watch a film with him and his long-term partner, Nicola. Following the pattern of most unmarried people in Montenegro, Ivan had lived in the same house as his parents most of his life. Um, when I arrived, I first entered the living room. I greeted Ivan's mother and father. I chatted with them a little bit. And then I headed for the bedroom where Ni Ivan and Nicola regularly spent three or four nights a week. The other three or four nights, they were in Nicola's small rented apartment on the other side of the town. Nicola told me about his day. So he told me how after work, he cooked lunch with Ivan's mother. And I remember that even um, Ivan's father recently helped Nicola to fix a bicycle. However, despite all of this family intimacy, despite the sleepovers in the same bedroom of the parental house, their love was effective, effectively still the love that dares not speak its name. This means that for years, even the Nicola have lived in what Schwab and Kuchar called the transparent closet, which means that uh, no one in the family spoke openly about the fact that they were in a relationship. Even the Nicola kept most of their bodily intimacy behind the closed doors, while even parents kept their eyes and ears shut. These two scenes, 
pose challenges to the conventional liberal opposition between being free and being watched by the police, between coming out and hiding in a closet, between autological subjectivity and genealogical society, to use the terms that were offered by Elizabeth Povinelli in Anthropologies. In Povinelli's vocabulary, the autological subject refers to, and this is a quote, discourses, practices, and fantasies about self-making, self-sovereignty, and the value of individual freedom that were associated with the Enlightenment project of contractual constitutional democracy and capitalism, while genealogical society refers to discourses, practices, and fantasies about social constraints that are placed on these autological subjects by various kinds of inheritances. Both terms actually refer to forms of governance or forms of discipline in um, late liberalism, and this framework of late liberalism includes Montenegro as well. However, it would be wrong to assume that Pirko's public coming out makes him a good autological subject, or it would be wrong to assume that even silence, that the fact that he speaks, that he is quiet about his relationship to his parents, makes him only suffer under the constraints of the genealogical interrelatedness. In both of these scenes that I've described, we can find elements of individual freedom and social constraint, and the not quite liberal dynamic between them needs further exploration. And in this talk today, my aim is to discuss local ideas or notions of freedom that circulated among my interlocutors. So gay men from Podgorica talked about freedom in different ways. Sometimes they talked about freedom as an individual right to make choices for yourself. At other times, they would use the idea of freedom as an aspiration or something that is somehow that uh, needs to be perpetually pursued and, and never that can never be quite achieved. They also talked about freedom as a shared and a collective category. And this is something that I found really interesting and I will focus on uh, today. So for instance, they would sometimes say that no one is free unless we are all free. This is a relatively well-known uh, activist slogan or, or various somehow uh, movements for social justice, LGBT, racial, and so on. When they use this emic notion of freedom as a shared or collective category, they, they, they evoke the imaginary of freedom as shared. And I will try today to, to um, unpack this idea, to, to, look, to try to see what, what, what it was all about, in order to uh, consider whether we can analytically conceive of freedom as this shared social and collective category, rather than as an individual possession or an individual right. My interlocutors also describe themselves as free in some situations that others would not necessarily see in the same way. So for instance, several years ago, even told me that our mutual gay acquaintance is not like Nicole and me, he is not free. I jumped in and I um, asserted, but neither are you and Nicola free, thinking of, of this um, tra transparent closet in which they lived and this confused and embarrassed him. And this conversation actually prompted me to start thinking about the conditions under which some gay men in Podgorica could see themselves as free. And I started calling this semic idea among my interlocutors non-autological freedom, and I will soon explain what this means. So unpacking how gay men in Podgorica understood, understood and pursued freedom during my research speaks about the need to link anthropology of morality and ethics uh, with anthropological thinking on relationality. Anthropologist James Laidlaw um, conceptualized freedom as a socially and historically grounded or shaped possibility to choose a moral self, uh, a socially and historically grounded possibility to choose what kind of a person you want to, to become. Um, Laidlaw worked on Jain ascetic and confessional practices in India, and he concluded that freedom for these giant ascets consists in the possibility of choosing the kind of self that one wishes to be. That is, it consists in the possibility to practice the chosen techniques of the self, to use Foucault's term, even if it means choosing asceticism. And with this argument, Laidlaw somehow opened a whole subfield that is called the anthropology of ethics and morality, where freedom is understood um, as the capacity that we have to engage in ethical reflection, reasoning, dilemma, doubt, conflict, judgment, and decision regarding what kind of social, historically particular persons to, to become. Actively answering the ethical question of how uh, or as what one ought to live means to exercise this self-constituting freedom rights later on. And this concept of freedom reflects the position of my gay Montenegrin friends only up to a point 
because it focuses on an individual, uh, individualized subject. So the ways in which moral de deliberation actually took place in everyday life among gay men in Podgorica suggests that we need to develop an understanding of freedom as a relational category that emerges between people and that regulates their interpersonal relations. So I ask what happens with our anthropological understanding of freedom and choice when instead of a more or less coherent singular ethical system such as Jainism, which we may choose or may not choose to practice in order to become this chosen moral self, what happens when the situation is more complex? So what happens with our understanding of freedom and choice when choosing the moral self means wanting to be both a gay person and a loving son in a social context that actively denies this possibility. And I argue that in such situations, we can find a non-ontological understanding of freedom, um, which means for my, which my interlocutors understand as a responsibility towards self in relationship with others. So in my reading, non-ontological freedom is a form of freedom that is pursued in an everyday life through an open and shared deliberation that is premised upon imaginative identification. And I will discuss, explain these two concepts in detail later on, open and shared deliberation on the one hand and imaginative identification on the other, because they are crucial for understanding the contours of this non-ontological freedom among my interlocutors. And before I illustrate this argument ethnographically, let me briefly just position myself. Um, up to a point and describe my fieldwork. As um, many of you know, I have been learning about the life of LGBT people in Podgorica for, for over a decade now as a friend and as an ethnographer who has been involved in the Montenegrin LGBT human rights movement from its early days. I forged or deepened many personal friendships through this work. I organized and participated in various activist anthropological initiatives around the LGBTIQ issues in the country with the help of some of you who are, who are here today. Um, and I learned also through 10 semi-structured interviews that I conducted with gay men in 2012, when I tried to understand their perspective on gender, sexuality and activism. And two years ago in 2019, I conducted seven more interviews with gay men and LGBT activists, um, some with the same people as seven years before that, um, focusing on their personal explications of freedom. So this is very much an ongoing research as, as I've mentioned. And I look forward to your feedback on it. Non-ontological freedom. This is a long quote. What Mirko told me during our interview, uh, how he understands freedom in his everyday life. And I'm going to, to read it. Um, although it's so long. So he, Mirko says, freedom means respect for the other. In our conditions, actually no one's freedom means you can do as you please, no one's. And especially not for us who want to be free in this society. People try to find a little blemish on us gays. In the conditions of the Montenegrin society, I think we have space to be free, very much so, but not to do as we wish. What do I mean by this? It means we should not, ex uh, it doesn't mean we should not express ourselves. It means that if we decide to be free in this particular moment of the development of the consciousness of this society, we then have a responsibility to behave decently or pristina. This does not mean we should not express our emotions. Go ahead, kiss, hold hands, have a normal intimate relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend, it is all fine, but we cannot behave arrogantly or bahat. We need to pay attention to what we are doing. And with these words, Mirko very eloquently summarized this concept of freedom that circulates among LGBT people in Podgorica, according to which freedom is not so much about choosing what you wish, but about navigating social relations in a way that enables you to stay true to yourself and simultaneously to uh, be respectful of others or to behave in a way that my interlocutor saw as respectful of others. Um, and I'm calling this non-autological freedom, although it is a very um, ugly word, um, in order to differentiate it from this autological freedom, which is understood as the freedom of this ideal, fictional, liberal, individualized subject who makes their decisions as they wish independently from social obligations. So in its non-autological form, Freedom means an ability to engage in a certain practice while thinking through the conditions and the constraints uh, of this practice from various positions. So it means freedom to be out as a gay person, but under police protection, to organize pride, but behind two police cordons, to sleep with a lover in the family house, but not to talk about it openly. 
Mirko, Ivan, and other gay friends of mine from Montenegro did not quite choose the conditions and constraints under which they can engage in these practices. So if they could, they would have changed these conditions and constraints. Yet the conditions and constraints did not stop them from engaging in these practices. And this unfree freedom is not the property of an individualized liberated subject who can make autonomous choices. Instead, it refers to, to an act, to the practice of deliberating, figuring out how to move through social relations, through the knot of social relations and obligations, and uh, an act of deliberation that is either done collectively as an actual conversation with other people, or by engaging in imaginative identification with others. And this non-autological um, freedom is premised upon imaginative identification. Um, and this is a notion that was also um, coined by, by a political and moral philosopher, Sophie Grace Chappell, developing her framework for moral philosophy. It is somehow grounded in experiences of everyday ethical reasoning. Political and moral philosopher, Sophie Grace Chappell writes that an important yet often overlooked aspect of everyday ethics is the activity that we may call imaginative identification. And she writes that this means understanding, getting a feel for, learning vicariously and fictively to inhabit not only my own point of view, but other people's points of view too. And uh, this seems like a relatively simple point, but it's uh, actually surprising how little discussion there is of the fact that when we reason morally, we often uh, put ourselves in other people's shoes, and we do it also very often in a conversation with others, which is also something that Sophie Grace Chappell um, writes about. And this imaginative identification was central also for ethics as it was understood and practiced by my interlocutors in Podgorica. So for instance, Nicole and even engaged in this imaginative identification with their parents regularly. So they regularly put themselves into their parents' shoes, trying to figure out how to act or how not, not to act, in order to prevent their parents from feeling embarrassed or offended. And this was the key aspect of this reflexive relationality they engaged in. And Nicole even claimed that he did not want to talk with his mother about his sexuality because of her weak heart, as if the very fact that he was gay could somehow physically hurt her. Similarly, Ivan said that he did not want to kiss Nicole in front of his parents out of the consideration for their feelings. And Ivan was afraid of endangering this delicate balance that they uh, established in his, his household. At any given moment, he, uh, he could have initiated a conversation with the parents and he could have uh, broken basically this transparent closet. Um, and there were periods when he was close to doing this, yet he always decided against speaking openly. The transparent closet seemed to be good enough, not quite what, what, what they would have chosen, but it offered more intimacy from what they may have gotten otherwise if they decided to ignore the perspective of the parents. So stated briefly, non-ontological freedom is not about choosing the kind of self you want to be, but about figuring out how to move through social relations in a way that would allow you to do what you want while in engaging in this imaginative identification and deliberation with others. And importantly, this kind of effort was not distributed evenly. So if even an equal invested effort to put themselves into their parents' shoes, the reverse was hardly the case. And I will come back to this inequality uh, later. As I've mentioned in the Montenegrin LGBT activist settings and elsewhere uh, among gay men, there were occasional references to this famous slogan, I am not free until we are all free. Or niko nije slobodni dok nismo svi slobodni. And I asked Miljan, another gay friend, to explain to me how he understands this assertion. And he gave me an example from his life. Several years previously, Milian was in a relationship with uh, Peter. Peter was a young man who uh, had lived in a transparent closet at the time in the same house as his parents. Although Milian was out during his weekly visits to Peter's place, he pretended to be his straight buddy. So as he explained to me, this meant that he could not be free until Peter and, Eddie and any future boyfriend and friend was free. Isaiah Berlin's vocabulary of positive liberty and negative liberty does not fully help us to understand the nuances of Milan's position. So in Berlin's reading, negative liberty means that an individual, a person is free from external limitations, while positive liberty means that an individual is free to make choices for themselves. And Milan seemed to practice both of these forms of freedom um, most of the time. 
So by coming, he, he came out as a gay man to his mother, uh, friends, and various other people, colleagues at work, and so on. So he exerted this positive liberty to pursue life and the moral self that he desired as a kind but fabulous artist who was also a gay man, a son, and a brother, and so on. And the fact that many people in his life were largely supportive of him brought him also a lot of negative liberty from these external constraints and limitations in the everyday life. And this was also supported by various legal and policy rights and changes that the LGBT activists won over the last decade in, in Montenegro. Yet his freedom was clearly affected by the choices that people in his everyday life made that were related to him as the example of Peter and his parents demonstrates. So uh, Sophie Grace Chappelle reminds us that deliberation is often done collectively uh, so that when we think about the good thing to do and the right thing to do, we often do so not while sitting alone in a room and deliberating, but in a conversation with others. And uh, this fact seems to be overlooked in many works of, of moral philosophy and moral anthropology as well. So we tend to forget that when we engage in moral reasoning, we often do so together with others. In, in Chappelle's reading, shared de deliberation means the consultation of others based on the recognition of the decisions that I'm proposing to take are not just my decisions, but our decisions. They're decisions in which those others have just as much stake and say as I do, and in which they have an equal right to my own to be recognized as deliberators. So Chappell reminds us that ethics is not necessarily enacted through individual acts of deliberation. Instead, ethics is often enacted through this open and shared deliberation that is informed by imaginative identification with others. Moral deliberation, just like political deber deliberation, is of the shared and social nature, writes Chappell. In other words, there um, are situations in which uh, figuring out what's a good or a right thing to do has a social character and is organized as a shared activity, just like happened with me and, and Petr. And this insight that we often morally deliberate together with others helps us understand Minyan's position better. So in the case of Minyan and Petr, it means that Petr's decision regarding his coming out affected both of them, just like Minyan's decision to respect Petr's transparent closet did. So importantly, whatever deliberation Petr's parents may have engaged in also deeply shaped Minyan and Petr's everyday life. And in this case, any decision on a good thing to do, to keep quiet, to speak up, to show affection, but not to verbalize it and so on, any of these, um, any of these possibilities, the decisions made on, on these possibilities was premised upon social relationality and affected the self in relationship with others. Whatever choices and acts these people made outside of, of that house. So Minyan's ethical choices were so entangled with patterns that we can understand their freedom as shared, as indeed Minyan did by citing this claim that I'm not free until we are all free. So just like Leilo suggests, the liberation remains a constitutive element of this relational understanding of freedom. However, the contours of freedom depend on the empirical specificities of this process of deliberation. Is it shared? Is it not? Is it open? Is it closed? How it relates to nonverbal aspects of social relations and so on. And, um, I'm not sure if you can see the title now, and it's, it's called Inequality of Imaginative Identification. So it's important to emphasize this profound sense of inequality in the interpretive labor that was invested by the gay men and others um, to keep their social relations going. David Graeber's writings about interpretive labor are useful for understanding this um, inequality and sense of inequality. So in uh, Graeber's view, interpretive labor consists of um, continual work of imaginative identification, as well as the work of understanding how the social relations in question really work. Following feminist standpoint theories and critical race theories, Graeber argues that interpretive labor is unequally shared. Relationships that are founded upon strong asymmetries of power, relations in among people who, who live in situations of structural inequality, create what he calls the lopsided structures of imagination. This means that, and this is a quote, those on the bottom of the heap have to, sp have to spend a great deal of imaginative energy trying to understand the social dynamics that surround them, including having to imagine the perspectives of those on top, while those on top, the latter, can wander about largely oblivious to much of what is going on around them. And interpretive labor seems to have been unequally shared in Ivan's household too. The one and only verbal acknowledgement 
Ivan's relationship at his home came one day out of nowhere, seemingly, when his mother said, I couldn't have wished for a better daughter-in-law than Nikola. So Nisa mogla poželjeti bolju snahu od Nikola. And this comment illustrates that for Ivan's mother, her son's relationship with Nikola was both unimaginable and somehow accepted. So the only way that she could find to interpret it was through this heteronormative pattern. So this comment inscribed Nikola into the kinship relations of their family, but through this heteronormative vocabulary. So the mother did not invest interpretive labor to adapt the category of the daughter-in-law, the child-in-law, to reflect Nikola and Ivan's situation. Instead, she in a way adapted Nikola to this, to this category. And this succinctly expresses this inequality of interpretation that was present in the non-ontological forms of freedom among gay men in Podgorica. So Nikola and Ivan often made their judgments and choices by thinking about things from the perspective of the parents too, as I've already mentioned. So for instance, they decided against joining the Pride Parade in order to save Ivan's parents from additional stress since the parents were elderly, they were financially in a weak place, and they were still struggling with embarrassment from being let go from their play, workplace as redundant during the privatizations that took place in the mid 2000s. I could not ask Ivan's parents um, how they dealt with this transparent closet. However, from what I observed, they did not seem to put themselves in Ivan and Nicola's shoes. It seemed as if they invested imaginative identification towards the outside world instead. So the parents seem to make an effort to keep the appearances going in front of their neighbors and visitors, for example, by calling Nicola Ivan's buddy or a friend. And another good example of the, of the large amount of this interpretive labor uh, that was invested by gay men uh, can be found in exchange between Oliver, another gay friend of mine who lived in a transparent closet for years, and his, um, the custom, customers of his headstrong grandmother and, and uh, the grandmother herself. So the grandmother was a summer rentier. She basically rented the rooms in her house over summer to uh, tourists. And also following Montenegrin customs, she, she, had been, she had been wearing only black, uh, black clothes after her husband's death. And she was this very formidable figure in the family. And once when Oliver was talking to the tourists who were renting uh, rooms in her house, he told them that he was a virgin. And by this, he meant that he had never had sex with a woman. And this was, this was a rather unusual interpretation of virginity in this, in this context. I, I have never heard anyone else talk about virginity in this way in, in Podgorica. So Oliver basically engaged in interpretive gem, gymnastics in order to present himself to others in a way that he thought was both true to himself and acceptable to others. And with this comment, Oliver also reiterated the heteronormative vocabulary in a way, but in order to be able to do so, he had to invest interpretive labor to change the meaning of virginity. Interestingly, his grandmother rejected his interpretation. Upon hearing uh, this, she burst out laughing and she rejected his interpretation of virginity by responding, you a virgin, maybe in the ass and not even there. And Oliver was both horrified and amused by this strange combination of aggressiveness and acceptance that was expressed in this comment. So he saw it as a hilarious joke and as a sign of recognition of his sexuality, although he also felt that the grandmother wanted to embarrass him and to show him who's the boss, as, as he said. And I would need to conduct more um, ethnographic work with Oliver's grandmother or even parents or Mirko's neighbors and other people in the life of my interlocutors in order to explore this inequality of interpretive labor further, but I think it's, it's clearly there. Um, now, the non-autological form of freedom among my interlocutors in Podgorica resembles in some important ways the concept of social freedom as responsibility towards the other that was developed by the economic historian Karl Polanyi in his, um, 1920, in his text from 1927, Über die Freiheit, or On Freedom. Polanyi articulated the concept of social freedom in the following way. This is also a long quote that you can see on the screen. I'm going to read it now. For the socialist, acting freely means acting while conscious of the responsibility that we bear for our part in mutual human relationships, outside of which there is no social reality, and realizing that we have to bear this responsibility. 
So being free therefore no longer means as in the typical ideology of the bourgeoisie to be free of duty and responsibility, but rather to be free through duty and responsibility. So it is not the freedom of those who are relieved of the necessity to choose, but the freedom of those who choose um, not freedom of relief from duty, but the duty which one assigns oneself. It, it is thus not a form of releasing oneself, oneself from society, but the fundamental form of social connectedness, not the point at which solidarity with others ceases, but the point at which we take on the responsibility of social being, which cannot be shifted onto others. Now, Polanyi develops this notion of social freedom as a philosophical response to the criticisms that 20th century socialism fails to address people's vision of a good life and that it focuses instead exclusively on socioeconomic injustices. So for Polanyi, freedom is possible through what he calls social knowledge, that is awareness of all the ways in which our actions affect others, for example, through economic relations, legal relations, and so forth. The fundamental similarity with the concept of non-autological freedom lies in the placing of this reflexive relationality at the heart of freedom. So both the understanding of freedom among gay men in Podgorica and Polanyi's notion of social freedom is about deliberating, figuring out how we should move through social relations so that we do what we wish while being responsible towards others. The key difference is that because Polanyi's concept of social freedom is prescriptive, it's normative, it's also progressive and emancipatory, it presumes in advance that this responsibility is equally distributed among all members of a political community. As we have seen, this was not the case for the gay men from Podgorica and their relatives. So Polanyi's social freedom is possible only if all the people in the political community engage in this shared deliberation with one another and invest more or less the same efforts to figure out how their actions affect others. While, as we have seen, my gay interlocutors seem to invest more effort into considering their responsibility for their part in social relations than their family members did towards them. And this meant that gay men often, um, often accommodated or seemed to accommodate their family's homophobia in their own lives. And it also meant that the interpretive labor that my interlocutors invested into social relations um, was heavier or somehow larger than that of others towards them. And I hope to do more research in the future to support this claim too. Um, and let me now briefly contextualize all of these snippets from fieldwork and, and discussions of freedom into the wider social context of, of Montenegro and LGBT activism there. Um, so non-autological forms of freedom among LGBT people in Podgorica are an element of actual existing liberalism in Montenegro. And I use this term because it evokes a much better, uh, better known concept of actual existing socialisms. Um, and I quote Hindus when I use this actual existing liberalism as a concept. It also goes against the hegemonic assumption that whatever is happening in the political worlds in Southeast Europe, in Montenegro, must be a kernel of the real developed form of politics um, elsewhere. So a real developed form of politics, it should take place when the region finally catches up with proper Europe. As a social anthropologist who studies LGBT activism and humanitarianism, I'm not concerned with the question whether the Montenegrin political community follows liberal principles fully or partially. That line of thinking is more appropriate for what an anthropologist, Data Janowska, calls the diagnostic mode of knowledge production. Um, and by diagnostic mode of knowledge production, she refers to, to a mode of knowledge production that measures how particular people and places fair in relationship to an already defined problem. And it identifies and corrects social problems that prevent the presumable full achievement of liberal democracy and free market economy. So instead of uh, in the diagnostic mode of knowledge production, I'm rather interested in an ethnographically informed mode of critical knowledge production, which aims to tease out the effects of, of that which we call liberalism in the context of Montenegro, by exploring the forms of freedom that it makes possible and looking at how it shapes everyday lives and subjectivities um, of LGBT people in Podgorica. Now, I'd also like to make clear that ontological freedom is a fiction. Um, when we talk about freedom of this individualized subject who can make choices however um, they want, this is an ideal type model that, not, that does not exist in any social context or, or uh, at least most of them. 
However, this model also strongly shapes people's imaginations and hopes and practices. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in Povinelli's reading, autology and genealogy are forms of discipline in liberalism, and the same disciplinary pair operated in post-socialist Montenegro. It was very effective, um, and their freedoms of LGBT people have been used by the EU observers as an indicator of this European progress of the whole country away from socialist and Balkan traditions and towards the so-called European values. Um, so LGBT activism has been an exemplary locus of the, this EU European disciplining of, of Montenegro. But the effects of the Europeanization cannot be captured through this opposition between freedom and obligation or autology and genealogy. The Europeanization of Montenegro made my gay interlocutors neither as free nor as oppressed as they may seem from this liberal um, perspective. When we look at the legal rights that LGBT people have won in Montenegro, the situation seems rather um, as, it, as if it's progressing. So the fact that the law on same-sex partnerships was adopted last year by the Montenegrin parliament, and the fact that pride parades have been successfully organized seven or eight years in a row, uh, these two facts would suggest a relatively high level of freedom for LGBT people in the country. Yet the thorny issue for many of my LGBT friends in Podgorica is that Montenegro pride usually attracts very few LGBT people from Montenegro, from the country. So the handful of local LGBT people who do come to the Montenegro pride do so mostly as volunteers or they wear face masks in order to disguise themselves um, even when it's not a pandemics. pandemic. Similarly, there's a certain anxiety that even though the law on same-sex partnerships was adopted in 2020, local gay people will rarely use it. As one of my friends said, uh, and this friend is both an activist and, and um, a lesbian. We now have a law on gay marriage, but we still don't have an openly gay bar in Podgorica. And this comment illustrates well how uneven social change feels for LGBT people in Montenegro. And these sorts of paradoxes and problems and exclusions that ethnographers have noted throughout Southeast Europe, um, um, such as Boyan Bilic, who, who is here among us, um, are invisible in the discourses of autology and genealogy. They are, so these paradoxes and problems and exclusions are, however, the center of this non-autological understanding of freedom that I could trace among my, my gay friends in Podgorica. So the work um, that was invested by various national and international actors into the Europeanization of Montenegro was supposed to teach the Montenegrins that individual freedom and group coercion are clearly distinct. And it is the task of the state and the civil society to prevent the latter, so group coercion, from jeopardizing the former, individual freedoms. Um, so for Montenegrins, becoming European after socialism meant, among other things, learning these discourses of autology and genealogy and reframing obligation, coercion, and freedom accordingly. However, the actually existing liberalism in Montenegro is a, is a configuration in which obligation and freedom were not strictly separate, but intricately interwoven. And one effect of the Europeanization of Montenegro through the LGBT activism was not the separation of obligation from freedom as, um, as might have been hoped for. Instead, one effect of the Europeanization of Montenegro was the production of a split between activist and everyday understandings of freedom or autological and non-autological forms of freedom. Um, across the interviews that I conducted with LGBT activists and with gay men, it was mostly the activists who described themselves as unfree. And as a matter of fact, um, Mirko asked me if he should explain what freedom means to him as an activist or as a gay man. So I asked him, what does freedom mean to you? And he said, do you mean for me as a gay man or do you mean for, do you mean for me as an activist? And I asked him to explain this difference. So personally, Mirko claims to feel free in the non-autological manner that I described earlier. However, as an activist, he sees freedom as something that he does not have and that he needs to strive to perpetually, without compromise, um, achieve. He said that speaking as an activist, I think that our gay men, they're so oppressed that they have a twisted perception of, of freedom. Yet, what may seem like a twisted perception of freedom from um, this activist perspective, it is informed by Europeanization and discourses of autology and genealogy and so on, we can read the same twisted perception of freedom as a progressive and emancipatory vision of, of freedom of a radical socialist. 
So non-ontological concept of freedom expresses a commitment to an alternative kind of a social contract, in my view. As mentioned earlier, social, social freedom for Polanyi means that people think through the relations of dependence and obligation between them, and they decide to engage in such, in such relations caring for one another without exploitation and, and oppression. And this is again a very nice quote from the same text, which I will also read. So Polanyi writes that uh, the final meaning of social freedom is to directly track the repercussions of our life impulses on the lives of all the others. And in this way to be able to assume responsibility for the social effects of our existence. So one of um, many things that I learned from my gay friends in Podgorica, and this is a conclusion to, to this talk, is that assuming responsibility for the social effects of our existence um, can be part and parcel of a sense of freedom. And perhaps instead of trying to get rid of this non-ontological freedom as twisted, it would make sense to work on creating structural conditions to make it more prominent and on making the interpretive labor that it requires more evenly distributed among all members of the Montenegrin political community, starting from the family members of LGBT people. So if we see freedom as this relational act of deliberating together with others on how to move through social relations in a way that enables us to do what we want while respecting others, um, we can also figure out how to fight against homophobia in ways that follow these non-ontological concepts of personhood, obligation, responsibility. And this reflexive relationality of non-ontological freedom offers us an opportunity to see the responsibility for others as the key component of the social contract. And I will now end here. I will also stop screen share and I look forward to your questions. And thank you so much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Charna. That was very fascinating. And I have to say, it's a, a perfect topic for um, our, our final talk for the semester, given that our next uh, cohort will be working on questions of freedom. Ah, interesting. So, okay. Very nice transition here. Um, if uh, we can open up to questions now, if uh, any brave soul wants to go first. Yes, please. Don't know if I can see everyone on one screen. Oh, I can. Um, so just gesture or speak up, please. Paul, thank you. I was determined not to go first, and 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 and, and I left this space. But but anyway, Chana, just just brilliant as ever. And and you know, I write something down saying oh my God, is this kind of taking liberal normativity? And then of course, five minutes later, you, you completely <laughs> go the other way. So I almost have nothing left other than to say yet again, you know, if you were not speaking from the positionality you are, you would be one of the most famous moral philosophers in the world. All right. And I think that's actually, let, let me just bracket that off because I think that's important in a sense. But I, but I think I want to, two things, I mean, one is the closet and the transparent closet, right? So clearly the transparent closet is, is the introduction of ambiguity and complexity, right? Yes. But, but even the idea of a closet suggests that there are actually three positions. There are in the closet, out of the closet, and in between, or kind of multiple. And, and you know, you know that criticism of actually the closet is a very context specific kind of conceptual apparatus. So I wondered why you chose that as a way into some of this, although I do think transparent closet is 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 wonderful. And you use the term sleepover. <laughs> and I thought, you know, and I thought that was incredibly interesting. And I wonder whether that was your term or or your respondent, because partly, of course, and this is where Graeber's going, right? Emotional and interpretive labor everyone does it but some some positionalities have to do more of it in more complex ways with more difficult sanctions than others right so you, you know one can imagine you know a universe a heterosexual student coming home at, at um holiday time and sleeping with a with a partner but 
there's also this framing of, you know, are they really having sex kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And sorry, sex was going to be my third point, because I do think there's a, you know, Boyle and I talked about this a long time ago, a literature on uh, sexuality that is reluctant to talk about sex. All right. And so your grandmother is actually a profound, a more profound ethnographer, a moral philosopher than many of us in the room. But it struck me that, you know, there are that relationship where half of the time you're in a room with with one person's parents and the other t half of the time you're in, I guess, a very small flat, but on your own. The, the, the materiality of space in terms of just just having sex is actually incredibly important, it, it seems to me. So I think I weaved two or three in, in, in there and, and I hope there were questions. Mm -hmm. Um, shall I respond now or? Uh, yes, please. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for the questions. I mean, you're as modest as ever when you talk about your friends, so thank you for that. Um, regarding the in and out and in between, I mean, I agree with you. At the same time, I like this notion of trans transparent closet because it makes clear the difference between somehow what's being said and what's being seen. And somehow everybody in this family or in such families knows what's going on and, and everything is somehow visible and yet never spoken about openly. And I think this distinction is, is important. It's, there is something about this visibility and invisibility and, and, and I don't know, making things, saying things out loud versus keeping quiet that, is, that becomes very clear through this image of a transparent closet. Um, but I should probably be more careful when, when um, Describing it, sleepover is my my term, so it's um, my overinterpretation or whatever. And um, I agree absolutely about the the materiality of, of of the space and whether or not it allows having sex and so on. At the same time, I mean, I mean, I know that even a Nikoli occasionally had sex in in the parental. Um, bedroom as well, or in the in the in the in the parental house, in the bedroom of the parental house. So it's not just about I don't know practicality. It was I don't know. It, it having an apartment on the other side of the of the town helped them to to um, have a place just for themselves, obviously. But at the same time, they really appreciate and enjoy this family intimacy and. Uh, joint lunches and so on. And this was one of the reasons why they haven't actually um, moved to this uh, smaller place uh, on a more permanent basis, let's say. So I'm not sure if I, if I, I mean, I'm just now thinking ethnographically without actually responding to, to any of the conceptual parts of your question, but I hope that it points in the direction of an answer, let's say. And um, do we have a, the next question ready? Who do we have here? Oh. Tanya, please. It doesn't have to necessarily not a question, but I think that just sort of like dwelling in this aspect of, of the sort of familial household and how different it is from, for example, a American household where you are expected to move at the age of 18 and then you establish your own life and very much so live without your parents um, up until kind of recently. Um, and, and this sort of aspect of, of that, the material aspect of the house seems so important for keeping this intergenerational ties. Um, and I really in, enjoyed that. I think Francesca also is really into housing and how important housing is uh, with most of our social lives here. But I, I kind of wanted to think about this uh, aspect of inequality of imaginative identification and within this sharing of houses um, that, that, for example, Nicola and Avon's parents didn't really put this, you say that they didn't really put themselves into their shoes, mm -hmm. whereas even and Nicola did really put themselves into his parents' shoes. But within presumably what I would assume is a very conservative context with the, regard to being gay, this this sort of transparent closet seems like in some ways a putting oneself into one's son's shoes that maybe I, I don't think I really could have imagined as, mm -hmm. you know, a teen in the 
early 2000s even uh mm -hmm. like having a relationship within the household even though everybody sort of stays quiet about it uh if you want to sort of mm -hmm. thank you thank you for that question i mean I think the problem here is that is, is somehow the lack of interpretive framework of the concepts or somehow the models and the ideas and the images of what a gay loving son means. Yeah. And for example, what many of the families in Montenegro do once they find out that their um, children, usually, usually son, because this is mostly what I've worked on, um, are, are gay, they would go either to a psychiatrist for a consultation or very often to a fortune teller. And depending on what these fortune tellers tell them, I mean, there some fortune tellers would be very somehow homophobic and then this doesn't help and they don't provide the sort of interpretive framework the parents could use then later on. But some would say things like, oh, he's actually interested in the per personality, so not in the gender, he's interested in what who, who the person is and he's a um, half gay or polo gay. This is something that I've, I've heard recently. And I mean, this gave then the parents the somehow an interpretive framework through which to kind of start thinking about their children or their child in, in, in a new way. And I think that the major problem in these situations is really uh, not that they don't want to put themselves into their children's shoes, but that they don't know how to do it because they don't have the, the framework to, um, to interpret what it means for their child to be gay and to still love them. And, and maybe, I mean, Sometimes when and my LGBT activist friends are very much aware of this. And when we somehow fantasize together uh, about what LGBT activism could look like, one project could be working on fortune tellers across the country on how to be on how to create these frameworks that would then help parents because they all already get from the EU, I don't know, funds to, to talk with medical and healthcare professionals and so on. So psychiatrists are not are less interesting. But maybe doing NGO projects with fortune tellers would be would be, I don't know, a useful, somehow socially effective way to 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 start providing these these interpretive frameworks to think about your own child as as also a gay gay person. So, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Uh, that's really fascinating that fortune tellers would be one of the first places to go, mm -hmm. but also makes sense. Um, yeah, and, and I think that really answers the question of like, it's impossible to be when one cannot imagine what this social category means as mm -hmm. loving son and also gay, uh, the capacity to put oneself into imaginative identification really. Mm. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Boyan? Um, thank you, Charna. Uh, this was so sophisticated and fine-tuned. I will have to read it to appreciate it better. But I have two small um, questions. The first one is, uh, how come you have so many um, gay friends? Um, mm. I haven't managed to make <laughs> so many in 20 years, I guess. Mm. <laughs> and um, the second one is, um, you focused so much on, on freedom, but I was thinking how the, the much more activist idea of liberation would, uh, would enter into, into your text and, and your research. So something more like um, a bit performative and developing and <clears throat> something that is a process and improves and people go backwards and forwards and mm -hmm. yeah. Something okay, in this so in this regard. Thank you. thank you for both questions. I mean, the first question you have no response, unfortunately. I mean, it has a lot to do with who I am as a person, and I, I haven't really talked about course, it yeah. Yeah, openly today. But um, I, I, it is in the article, and actually, we'll, we'll send it to you. And I, I would be grateful for your feedback on it. And um, I mean, being an ethnographer also means that you you somehow pester people and that you impose yourself upon people. So I partly use the networks that I've already have and partly also uh, pester people. And the second question, I mean, it's a, it's a really excellent question, which I don't touch upon in this paper or in this somehow segment, because it focuses so much on re these relationships between kinship and, and freedom and sexuality. But um, Yes, hopefully in, in other, I mean, in, in other segments of my research and hopefully in some future papers, I will focus on these other ideas of freedom or liberation um, more. So thank you for that. 
And um, do we have another question or? Uh, yes, Liliana. Ciao, Chadna. Th this was really, really great. I mean, I actually had the privilege of reading a version of this uh, before, so it was it was excellent to, to see to see you speak it out loud. I have one um, less serious. I mean, you just mentioned this because you didn't. You mentioned the fortune tellers. I'm really curious as to are these um, let's call them entrepreneurs themselves. Like these are persons. I'm assuming women, right? Let's talk about gender stereotypes uh, that are well known within say this town or or the city or are they more these informal types of, of fortune tellers right the mm -hmm. friend of a friend so is it is it a fortune teller is in a belief in a belief system or is it for fortune tellers as people within the community who have some form of uh, informal or informal uh, authority to to talk about these sort of because right if you're not looking at it as from this medical lens as this mm -hmm. pathological problem you're looking at it as this problem of of finding this twisted alignment i like the term twisted in mm -hmm. this concept um why why the fortune teller and then in that case who is this person if it's not an institutionalized person it's not like in the u.s right you have these shops with palm readers that you go to i'm and assuming no mm, it depends a lot on the family and who they have access to let's say but at the same time some of these fortune tellers there is a long line long long waiting list to get to them and they don't uh, they're, they're not registered so they're not formal somehow entrepreneurs they don't sell and they don't have a, a, a somehow price set for their services but they are paid for what they do and there is a lot of, of course negotiations and going on and so on and um i i mean they they they, they are they, they they are somehow part of the everyday life worlds in Montenegro very often and people consult them for various kinds of things um, that are related to intimate lives and personal lives and career and so on. Um, and somehow I think in these situations where people don't know, don't can't figure out how to behave and what to think and, and how to position themselves in this whole new thing for them. Uh, this is when they then seek the, the, the help of the fortune tellers. No, in that sense, it, it reminded me a lot of when you say it like that, of what Larissa Yasharevich wrote in her book on health and debt in the That's Bosnian market. Mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it, but it's a very good. Yeah, go ahead, please. Right, she, she talks about these um, or these alternative forms of, of medicine or, or medicine women uh, that people go to when they don't know that they, they can't find the answer to their question in these. Mm. classical channels that, that you search for so and then that that i find interesting and then it, it really opens up this larger debate not just around freedom but around this question of, of the psyche and who do you trust as the authority to to speak around um identity and self and in relation to family i mean if, if that route seems very interesting to me mm, and i agree i agree Thank yeah. you for the I'm on a waiting list for some of these fortune tellers. So hopefully in the future, I would be able to, to talk more about them. So, yeah. They're fascinating. Sounds fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, do we have another question or comment? Um, oh, yes, please. Misha. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Sharna. And I also, uh, I had the opportunity to read this before, and I love to see how it's developing. And I would just like to roll back the question that we were having already. But so, how much is actually this the concept that you're introducing of non ontological freedom something that is uh, bound to the, this context and actually bigger than than same sex relationships in that scale? Because for me, when you speak about it, it also resonates. The, the ways how people in my parents' community deal with other sexual stuff that are non-institutionalized, but they're also not considered as pathological, such as very institutional uh, lover, like Ljubavnica. And mm -hmm. it's almost this sort of level of semi-acceptance where everybody knows about it. And now they're making jokes that in the pandemic, the wife is bringing lunch and sending the husband over to Ljubavnica because she not can, cannot handle him anymore. And this sort of sounds a bit like like uh, Ivan and Nicola's situation. And mm -hmm. from that sort of perspective, I would ask actually, how much is it something that is existing here as characteristical, like something that is 
culture, like regionally sort of uh, institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Because remembering that was, as what Paul mentioned, we were sort of introducing this theoretical concept from the post-Victorian scholarship that likes to speak about sexuality without actually introducing sex. And I wouldn't really vouch for Yugoslav, you know, contribution to that because we are also sex shy. But how much is this actually something that is very Balkan or Western Balkan, this non-autological freedom? Mm, I mean, thank you for both questions. They're both great and I can't answer either uh, of them at the moment, but I can say that this is something that I was also thinking about and I would like very much to, to do a broader comparative research because I also have a sense that this non-autological form of freedom is whatever, negotiation and so on, exists in situations of clear structural inequality as well throughout the Balkans and maybe elsewhere as well. I, I, I don't know, I can't say, but somehow and, and in this idea, in any case, I think that the freedom should mean figuring out how um, how to behave and who I want to be and what I want to do while respecting others and taking into account what others are doing is not somehow specific to the Balkans. I would say it, 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 it is a much, much broader, of course. Um, and how broad and how historical it is somehow maybe specific to this point um, in time of the life of the, let's say, I don't know, civil society in the Balkans or whatever, um, not civil society, civic life in the Balkans. I mean, this is something that um, needs more research, but um, I would say that in the last five to 10 years, we, we are witnessing somehow the stronger, the, 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 the intensification of the calls of various activists and other involved actors to this kind of freedom um, in the Balkans, partly because of, um, the, restructure, the, the, the political, broader political and economic changes that have been going on in the region as well. So I think it's, it's somehow also a, 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 this clear articulation of this non-autological freedom among gay men in Podgorica, for example, and many other groups throughout the Balkans is, I think, also somehow specific to this historical moment. But um, I, I need to do more research to, to, to substantiate this more, let's say. Uh, do we have a, another comment or question or uh, should I just, uh, oh, Tanya's bubbling up over there. Please, Tanya. Not this time, Kevin. You won't get all the last questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Kevin and I lived together up until last week, so we have a friendly roommate relationship. <laughs> um, so with this with this concept of non-ontological freedom and, and again, it's not really a question, just sort of a thinking of, so when Mirko says the the his sort of framework of what it should be like to be uh, LGBTQ in this context is this the idea of like respecting others, like sure kiss and hold hands mm -hmm. and everything else, but don't act uh, bahata. Mm -hmm. um, and within the, this, it, it that one seems like this framework of a liberal, liberal LGBT identity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This. Uh, sort of homonormative politics of don't be too gay. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other side of the non-ontological, so like, I wonder if that is non-ontological or is it simply this liberal discourse of what it should be to be gay within this homonormative framework? I wouldn't say it is because I think from the liberal, from the perspective of liberal discourses of freedom, uh, it was somehow circulating us, especially in, the, in these LGBTIQ NGOs in Montenegro. Freedom was this thing that is somehow never fully achieved, and something that you need to very um, you need to perpetually strive for, and it somehow required um, a person who is um, willing to cut out all the social ties in order to be free, in order to do what they what they need to do and what they want to do, and uh, this is something that activists I think advocated very strongly uh, when being activists. However, when they were being in other uh, parts of their uh, everyday life when they were, um, I don't know, in, in, with, with their parents and so on, they would also use this, this idea of non-ontological freedom. So I don't think it's, it's um, uh, 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 I, I, I don't, I, I think it's, it's a clear, actually, it's a clear opposition to the, the liberal discourse of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and I think with that, it, it can kind of go with uh, Misha's idea of this. Um, have you thought much about the sort of concept of intergenerational sacrifice that's sort of more common seemingly in the Balkans, like, you know, parents must do everything to sacrifice mm -hmm. to be able to have for their children and then children will eventually sacrifice for their parents and this sort of mutual protection where it doesn't, this, this sort of more liberal framework of I will do anything to be free however I want doesn't fall into it. So it becomes sort of cycled in to these mm -hmm. two things, mm -hmm. right? I, um, I think that y yes and no. And I think the difference here is that uh, there wasn't uh, a way to be a gay neighbor or a gay son that was mm -hmm. already accepted. And you could cite it and, um, and, and, Yes, I think this is this is this is. I don't. I don't think this was somehow an, an acceptance of submission, an acceptance of of um, of. Yeah, I'm thinking now about Saba Mahmoud and her uh, work on freedom among women who were uh, followers of Islamic piety movements and who she claims were free because they were willingly submitting themselves to this discourse of Islamic piety. We can't, I don't see this in Podgorica and Montenegro because there was no discourse that told these people how to behave as a gay son, for example, or as a, as, or as a, as a gay neighbor or whatever. Um, that, 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 that there was no discourse of submission there that, that um, they could cite. I think that they were very much figuring out things as they were going and, and negotiating them. And this is where why also they felt free, I would I would say, because they there were no scripts that they could follow, so they had to, it was up to them to to create them. Yeah, I, I think I would agree. It sounds absolutely right. Is there uh, another question that's come up or a comment perhaps? Or is it my time? Uh, all right, well, I'll just um, throw in a, oh, do we have uh, someone here? Okay, um, I'll, I'll just throw in a, a quick observation um, from, from my own experiences in the Balkans that your talk kind of helped me uh, understand in a, a different way than I had previously. And um, it was with a, a close friend of mine in Sarajevo who is a lesbian. And she was the Osprey. She had spent much of her life in the US and would always stay with her parents in Sarajevo when she came home. And um, she would occasionally come back with her partners. And it was very much this transparent closet where it was framed as, oh, the, my, my friend will be staying with us. Mm. And the parents, of course, said, oh, yes, it's no problem. And I asked if her parents knew, and she says, yes, they know, but we, we don't talk about it. We pretend like it's not a thing and mm -hmm. explain this kind of concept. And at one point, uh, after she was seeing someone fairly seriously for a number of years, she came to Sarajevo. And when she and her partner came in, the bed had been completely covered with rose petals. And in this case, it was almost as if her parents were the ones coming out. Mm. Because um, they were the ones who decided to leave this transparent closet mm. and acknowledge the situation for what it was. And mm. um, it, mm. it kind of helps me figure. Mm. Mm. I think it's, it's a beautiful example. And yes, and I mean, these kinds of stories are really interesting. Uh, and, and I hope to learn more about them uh, in order to explore this inequality in inter of interpretive labor. Um, deeper, let's say, or in more detail. But I love that story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And um, are there, oh, we have a question from Marco here. Yes, please. Sorry, I was un unmuted. Uh, Tana, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really brilliant. I'll just have one short question um, that I, could be like a follow-up from your previous research, but something that might be relevant as well here, um, the notion of Trovik, the notion of uh, being human, as somebody who has this respect towards, towards the other, something that is uh, so rooted in the, in the landscape of the Balkans. Um, so I was wondering if this concept of freedom 
is somehow related to that concept of człowiek and, uh, and if there are certain links there that emerge out of the material. Mm, thank you so much for the question. It's a really good question. I think it's it follows somehow the footsteps of what Misha was asking. And I would say yes. And at the same time, probably up to a point. I think there is something very specific, emic, local in this idea of understanding freedom. And at the same time, I think I assume, I think, um, this particular understanding of freedom became somehow more articulate, uh, better articulated in the last over the last 10 years due to the social and economic changes um, that have taken place in Montenegro um, with respect to LGBT activism, but also with respect to, to other things. I think that, um, yes, I mean, uh, gay men in Montenegro are not the only ones who, who talk about freedom in this way. And sometimes people who, who activists who, who work on know, environmental issues and, and so on also try to claim that freedom means taking responsibility for one another and so on. And in, this, this happened in the Balkans, in Bosnia, for example, as well. So I think there is something about the, the, the decade, the, histor the historical moment in which these kinds of claims have become possible to be articulated in a, in a clearer way, let's say, or, or have taken a shape that is somehow um, uh, uh, um, clearer, better defined. But at the same time, I also think it's very much rooted in, in um, in the local context. One of my friends, when we were talking about this, she translated this notion of non-autological freedom when she, she was reading the article and she translated it as ukorenjena sloboda or uh, rooted freedom. And I really like this translation. I think there is there is something to it as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marta. And um, do, we, do we have any more questions or comments? Nobody coming up? Um, oh, Zoran, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, I apologize if I missed something because it's uh, 1 a.m. here. I'm in New Zealand. <laughs> Thank you so and much for being with I'm, us. It's a pleasure to see you. <laughs> I'm not a sociologist, at least not yet. After 23 years in IT, I decided to this year start studying sociology and philosophy. So I know basically nothing about this. I was wondering, is there a difference in attitude in Montenegro between this uh, uh, transparent closet uh, towards gay men and say bisexual men? Mm. Would it be easier for parents if the, their son occasionally brought a girlfriend and then a boyfriend? And mm. would it... Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes, so for example, the, the mother that found out that her son was gay, but then uh, heard from the fortune teller that he's actually a semi-gay or polupeder. Um, <laughs> I mean, she was, she, she, th th this was somehow helpful for her that he is actually interested more in the personality than in the, in the gender per se. But at the same time, then, um, it turned out that the, the, the uncle, so the, her husband was uh, dead. So his brother um, threatened her that if the, the, if the son expresses his sexuality in any way that is visible to the small town in, in, in which they um, lived, she would not be um, allowed to be buried in the family graveyard. I mean, this is a huge moral concern. So I think, I mean, the, the issue of, of whether you're, I mean, gay, bisexual, I think it's not so much about that as it is about this incredible family and kinship somehow moral cosmos that it seems to be very somehow distant from, from these kinds of, of practices and, and so on. So I don't know. Does it help? Yeah. Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'll have to think about it. OK, thanks. And um, if, if there's any other comments or questions, do you speak up now? Um, OK, I suppose not then. Uh, Charna, do you have any, any parting remarks for us? 
I just want to thank you for um, well thinking together with me and asking all these uh, really good questions. And I hope that, I don't know, that we will keep this conversation going in the coming years. Thank you for the invitation to, to speak today as well. Once again. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this was a, a nice way to close off our, our final guest seminar of the semester. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll see each other all soon. Thanks. And uh, uh, Kevin, if I may, uh, you uh, now we are we are having former fellows and future fellows and uh, well you you will stay around uh, so we we just continue so very soon uh, by the mid march uh, we are going uh, to to go on with our seminars you're all welcome to join us and uh, if you don't uh, receive our newsletters please check that out on on our website uh, if you want to uh, uh, stay informed about our activities. I think uh, Paul uh, wanted to say something. Did... No? Okay, good. <laughs> good. I always look like I want to say something. It's just a bit. Yeah, good. Okay, no problem. <laughs> good. Thanks and uh, all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. bye.